Do you feel that in a time when we are more connected than ever, we are drifting away from real human connection, especially to ourselves? I do. Hi, I'm Leticia Latino, and I want to invite you to join me and my very inspiring guests in exploring ways to reconnect to your essence, to your definite purpose, to what makes you tick. Are you ready? Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of Back to Basics, Reconnecting to the Essence of You. My guest today is C.N. Williams. He's an educator turned speaker, business advisor, and personal transformation expert. His essentialist practices build a crucial bridge between personal insight, organizational development, and planetary transformation. He's also the author of Soil and Spirit, Seeds of Purpose, Nature's Insight, and The Deep Work of Transformational Change, a book about how to revive civilization by stepping forward and leading with one's own unique genius. Hello, Ian, and welcome to Back to Basics. Hello, Leticia. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. No, I'm very excited. And your book sounds, I mean, what a title. So I always, I mean, anybody writing about transformational change and the journey, I'm pretty sure that that doesn't come just from studying. I'm sure a lot of that is experientially. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the origin story, young Ian, and uh, also if you ever imagined that you would be trying to create this transformational, you know, initiative around the world? <laughs> Yeah, I think as a child, now that I look back, there was a sense of, you know, something greater later in life. Mm -hmm. But I didn't necessarily, you know, of course, you're not necessarily conscious of that as a child, at least I wasn't. As a child, you know, I, I typically say it was a, it was a pretty standard white American upbringing. I was middle class. I joke that we had everything except the white picket fence. You know, we were a four-person family. My parents were together. We always had a dog. Had a very stable childhood. Lived in the same home pretty much the entire time. So it was very stable. And that was wonderful. Uh, at that time in my life, there were seeds being planted of, you know, seeds of purpose in terms of connection with nature. My mother's a, a naturalist, really loves the outdoors. My father's an educator. So, you know, we had these, these values growing up. And then as soon as I hit uh, my adolescence, I wanted to shake things up a little bit. Um, <laughs> and so that began a journey of about 12 years of substance use and abuse, which naturally taught me a lot of things, led me to a lot of different places in life. But I think, you know, there was this kind of unconscious or subconscious drive to create a little bit of chaos mm. because my childhood was in fact so stable. Mm. Um, and that led to, you know, young adulthood, which is when I finally decided to take myself, my life, my health and well-being a little bit more seriously. So I'm seven and a half years sober in recovery now. Okay. Uh, and, and that process, you know, led to a lot of transformational change, as you alluded to, but we can we can take time to get into that in a little bit um, mm -hmm. more detail later on. That's uh, really great that you share, because I'm sure that there's a lot of, like, you know, in over 200 episodes, we've had all the possibilities at this point, like the stable person that had the challenge later on, or the challenge person, you know, very unstable childhood, and also finding their own journey. But all, all, all the stories have something in common, which is that greater purpose, as you say, the seed of purpose, which are so invaluable. And um, in terms of just because we have a lot of young audience as well, we've had uh, some guests that are 17 and making the world change. Anything that you can share just from that experience in terms of having a stable family, like any triggers, anything for the younger people to, you know, signs that they can look for in terms of creating chaos in their own lives? I mean, for me, it went back to mental health. I started using substances as a way to self-medicate. Again, I didn't know that at the time, but there was an underlying depression and anxiety there for me since early on in childhood. And you do what you can to address it. And, you know, my parents are wonderful people and still are and very loving and supportive, but we all have our own personal journey and experience. The bit of, I don't know if I'd call it advice or wisdom, but what I would say for the younger generation is regardless of how your upbringing is structured, whether it's stable, whether it's chaotic, the law of balance applies. And so 
For me, having a stable childhood, I was seeking a little bit of chaos to balance things out. And I've seen other people, you know, and other friends that I were growing up with who had a bit more chaotic experience growing up that were seeking stability. That balance really comes from self-awareness. I think that's really the root, you know, that's the tap root of everything in terms of self-actualization and transformational change. We have to know ourselves well enough to know how we show up in the world. We have to know ourselves well enough to know how to process through our experiences. Um, and we have to know ourselves well enough in order to be willing to take those leaps of faith and to trust that whatever we're committing ourselves to um, experientially, socially, professionally, etc., is going to pay off in the end, even though we might not be able to see that uh, in the here and now. So that self-discovery process, that self-awareness really came out of, you know, eventually it was curiosity for me. I just decided to get curious and uh, realized that I needed to learn a little bit more about myself in order to show up in a healthier way with, within myself. And that's what led to that kind of outer change along the way. Mm, I love that. I love the, the statement, decide to get curious. So in all those years as you were becoming an adult you went into uh, you became an educator i i read that right was that was your initial career path tell us a little bit about that yeah i went to school uh for my undergrad in psychology and community arts so i double majored and at the time i thought i wanted to be a therapist i was already seeing therapists in my life at that time for my mental and emotional health and every time I left that office, I thought, you know, if I could make one person a day feel this way, the way that I feel when I leave this guy's office, my job, my career would be entirely worth it. Hmm. And then when I hit the early adulthood years, I realized I can't even effectively deal with my own challenges. How am I going to be able to really support someone else authentically with their own challenges? But by that time, I was so deep in my undergraduate experience that I didn't want to change tracks. I didn't want to change majors. And it was just kind of a you know, synchronicity that when I landed my internship, I had the opportunity to work in an early childhood setting. And that was just something that completely transformed my life at the time. I loved it. I loved every moment with those children. And so I said, you know what, I'm just going to finish school. I'm going to get out. I'm just going to figure it out after the fact and was fortunate enough to find my way into early childhood where I spent about five years. During that time, I kind of woke up environmentally and so I eventually moved to nature-based education. I did that in a couple different settings. Um, one of them was for the University of Minnesota at their Landscape Arboretum. So I taught nature-based field trips in the children's garden there. But I've got educational experience outside of youth education as well. Um, at this point, I'm 10 years into mindfulness-based energy arts. And so I've taught Qigong and meditation. Um, I've taught you know workshops around self-exploration. So Education is pretty wide ranging and, you know, to connect back to the roots and, and my family, I, both my parents were eventually educators at, at one point in my life. And so um, Apple didn't fall far from the tree, I guess, in that sense. Mm, I love that story. I love the, the part of the journey. And then, and then you started, you know, with all these that you were, in, I guess, embedding in your life, you really became a personal transformation expert, right? It took a little time. That's where we are now. And I'm doing that work with individuals and as well as organizations. Mm. So the book Soil and Spirit is really written for the individual. It's written for the community. I did not want to write a sales book. Uh, and that's absolutely not what it is. So it's really just a message, a methodology for the individual who's in transition, hoping mm. to provide some foundational pieces that might move them forward or move them through that process. But from a theory of change perspective, I'm all about impact and impact at scale. And I really want to do that not only through the individual, but I also feel like focusing on organizations is an effective place to do it as well. Because in theory, within an organization, you have somewhat like-minded people and you have access to, again, in theory, greater impact, right? Because that organization is mission-driven in some way. It's mission-aligned in some way. And so if you can move into an organization and really address the individuals, as well as the organizational kind of infrastructure, you can bolster that organization from within, enabling it to have greater positive impact externally outside the organization. So my theory of change, whether it be individuals or organizations, is really in to out. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the work that I'm doing now. And 
we could talk more about that process if you'd like, but. Absolutely. Uh, I'm very curious. And, you know, I, I've had some guests and it's always, it's a conversation that it's, it excites me uh, in terms of becoming aware of the collective, like from me to we kind of conversation, which is really hard because it's, you know, it sounds nice, but then, you know, when you go into any business environment, big corporation, I mean, even creating small change, practical change, like saving money, you know, I mean, sales and you try to sell something that's going to save money. It's undeniable. And then people are so resistant to change, even with tangible results, something you can measure. Right. And so one of my biggest, let's say, fears, concern is like, if this is it with something tangible, you know, like money, <laughs> imagine like something like, you know, making the world a better place or just awakening to the way we should live as a collective, you know, and I, I feel uh, the pandemic was a little bit of that and you could feel it and you could sense it. And as we have moved away from it, even if still will have to deal with it. You, you don't feel it that much anymore. Like you can still see how we go in a little bit back to our old habits. I don't know if you would agree with that. Yeah, the the concept of change is an interesting one because there's this collective resistance to it. Mm-hmm. At the same time, if we really think about it, it's one of the few constants in life. Change is one of the only constants in life. It's always happening. And so from an individual standpoint, to think about the desire to kind of control and have stability and have consistency is not necessarily at odds, but it's on the other end of the continuum of what's naturally happening around, happening around us all the time, right? Yep. Um, and if you think about this from a physiological level, your body's changing, right? You're shedding skin cells, you're growing new cells, your neural networks are changing, the food you're eating is becoming your your physical body like change is constant and so again that balance is something that i think we really need to address and we need to be aware of if we're going to talk about systemic change at scale you know so to your point about organizations there's a reason there's kind of a method to the madness in the way that we work um and it comes not only from evidence based practices but it also comes from practical experience So those of us who have been employees in organizations before, we know what it's like to function on teams and we know what it's like to deal with the challenges of an organizational infrastructure that's not fully optimized, right? This is clunky. Um, There's a faster way to do this, but we're not implementing it. We're just dealing with team dynamics in general, right? The social dynamic. And so whenever we're working with organizations, we always go in first and we focus on organizational development, process optimization. We want to free up people's time and energy and bandwidth so that we can have a more sustainable conversation about what does employee well-being and engagement look like. So process optimization is kind of that first phase. Employee well-being and engagement is that second phase. And we feel like if we can strengthen the organization from within, that allows us to move to the third phase, which is social environmental impact. What's the impact that this organization wants to have beyond just their mission, right? Whether it's the widget that they're selling or the service that they're selling into What's something greater that this organization can commit to now that they have the time and the energy to do it? And I think that's a very similar process that I would, that I do and and often communicate, especially to those younger generations, which is focus on the basics of life, right? Get back to the basics in terms of what are the things that you need to address and have functioning properly on a daily basis? If you're struggling with your health, your mental health, your emotional well being, your physical health, address those things because without those, you now have a moving target to try and pin down as you move into a conversation about well-being, you know, in terms of a more holistic sense of well-being. So we need to, we need to address the individual and what's going on in the internal landscape and find a way to just find a way to streamline it and get in touch with what's going on internally. Because again, the more self-awareness you have internally, the easier it's going to be able to identify practical changes, tactical changes that you can make in your life that you will be able to equate to an outcome on the other side, right? And I think that's a really challenging part about personal transformation is if we're constantly walking in quicksand, it's hard to know what action had what impact. It's kind of like shooting from the hip in the dark. You don't really know if you're hitting the target and tomorrow it might be different. So 
again, to draw the parallel between the individual and the organization, trying to just map out what's going on internally and optimize that from an efficiency and effectiveness standpoint allows us to have a more sustainable conversation about well-being. And ultimately, I think that me versus we, as you mentioned, is a little bit more tangible at that point because we have a shared language and we have a shared understanding of process. Mm, I love that. I love that. Um, you know, obviously you you refer to going back to the basics, focus on the basics. That's really what the, my calling was when I created this podcast. It's almost like it's so simple if we focus on what matters to us and what's, you know, our baseline. And so I, I love the fact that you, in, in your book, you present, you know, the solution in terms of self-actualization and then the four primary landscapes. And I imagine that what you describe is what in your book you call the internal landscape, correct? Yeah. So it goes back to that theory of change. There's four major sections to the book. The first is the internal landscape. So turning inward, looking in and answering that greater calling of what am I here to do with my life? Right. And it's not, I don't want to sound new agey about that in the sense of like, there's this greater calling that's going to find you and you'll be, you know, struck with inspiration for the rest of time. Absolutely not. For some people, it works that way. For most people, it doesn't. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, we can design that inspiration in our life so long as we have the informational tools to do it. So the first is the internal landscape. And if we can do that work internally, it's going to naturally trickle outward into the social landscape right? The people around us, the communities around us, the organizations that we're a part of, etc. And that social landscape is then, of course, going to impact the environmental landscape, the physical landscape, ultimately reaching the spiritual landscape. So it's a two-way street, right? It's in to out and out to in. But I think about these as concentric circles. And from a theory of change perspective, if we can align ourselves internally, it's going to have that you know, kind of ripple in the pond effect, that trickle down effect that's going to impact the people around us, the physical world around us, as well as the spiritual landscape. And to me, that's a, that inner work is a spiritual process. Self-discovery is a spiritual process because there are many self-help gurus in the world. There are many self-help theories in the world. But one of the lines in the book is all of the self-help theories in the book won't measure up to the, the tiniest sliver of honest self-study. We're individuals and we are unique. And so the basics are going to look different for all of us once we reach a certain point of customization, right? I mean, we all have physical health, mental health, emotional health, social connections. If you think about those domains of wellness, we all share those from a you know humanity and a species level. But once we drill down to the nitty gritty of the individual, we're going to apply, you know, you and I might apply the same meditation practice differently. We might apply the same physical health routine differently. And so there's this kind of crossing of the Rubicon that we need to be aware of because the answers that exist externally need to be translated internally. And also this trust or faith that all of the answers that we seek are already within us but it's going to take some self-study, some self-discovery in order to uncover them. Hmm. That's uh, that's deep. I love that. And and also patience, I think, to uncover them. I, I, I totally relate with that. And not only for me, but with people around me that say they think they invest a few months on self-discovery and there's like already patient that he hasn't hit me. What's my greater calling? <laughs> And uh, for me, it has been almost like an iteration process. And every time you think you have it, and then you go through something else experientially, as you describe, then just like, oh, no, wait, that now I can incorporate this. And it's always ever, ever transforming, as you say. And so it's really a, an infinite amount of work that we have to put in there. It's, it's, it's not finite. The transformation, it, it's never ending, uh, I believe. It's iterative. I, I completely agree, right? There's this to go back to this notion that change is one of the only constants in life. What worked for me five, 10 years ago uh, in terms of, you know, well-being practices, some of those have fallen away, mm -hmm. right? And new practices have taken place. Social life, right? My social life from 10 years ago is very different than my social life today. These things are always changing. But one of the practices that we can implement is curiosity. And I think that curiosity is, it's almost the other side of the coin of patience. 
Because if we're outcome oriented and we're only doing the work in order to get a certain thing or to get to a certain place, it naturally puts us in a, a disposition that is not process oriented, it's outcome oriented. And so we would just want to rush through the process in order to get to the outcome. But if we can understand that the process is what is, is really the heart of the matter, and we can get curious about that process, it's going to bear more fruits than we initially thought at the onset of that journey. And so, you know, self-awareness, curiosity, and to your point, patience. I think if you put those two, those three things together, you have a pretty powerful mixture. And that's for the individual as well as the organization, right? If an organization wants to know more about itself, more about its culture, it's got to commit to an authentic process of discovery. Because it's one thing to take the employee engagement, you know, surveys every other year. Great. Well, we did it this year and now we put it on the shelf until a year from now. But it's another thing to really, you know, roll the sleeves up and get the hands in the dirt and talk about how do we want to shift the culture and what's it going to take to do that? And how long is it going to take to do that? Because we'd like to think of it as a three, six, nine month process. But the reality is to shift culture in an organization, especially a large one, takes time. And it's not enough to just wrap new pretty words around, you know, the same old thing. We actually have to make those systemic changes. But doing that work automatically creates the outer impact. It's a, it's the, it's a default. It's a byproduct of doing the internal work. And work might be a trigger word for some people. You know, it is for my wife. I mm-hmm. use that term inner work all the time. And she goes, I don't like to think of it as work because then it feels like it's something to do. And I totally get that, right? So insert whatever language you need in order to kind of connect with your own sincerity and your own authenticity. But that inner exploration is really something that is no one can take it from you. And also no one's going to be able to give you anything that is more impactful and powerful and moving than what you're going to discover for yourself. Amazing. And uh, so I'm curious as somebody as an expert in this field, uh, you know, you've written a book and you deal with organizations and and, and you're trying, you're committed to trying to change, to make this change happen. Uh, what are you finding out out there? Are we, can we be optimistic, pessimistic? Are we on a good track? Are we, I'm, I'm just curious. Well, again, balance. You, you brought up the pandemic a few moments ago. And one of the things that I continue to be excited about is that it felt like, and and still very much, we're in this period of kind of questioning the current paradigm. And we certainly have people who just want to go back to, you know, business as usual. Um, Let's just reestablish the, you know, I don't want a new normal. I just want to go back to the old normal. Um, There's always going to be that resistance, right? For individual change, for organizational change, for societal change. There's, There's always going to be that. At the same time, there's a lot of wonderful people doing really exciting work. And there's a lot of wonderful organizations doing really exciting work. One of the industries that I try and focus on is um, climate change, because that's something that I personally am passionate about. And if we want to address that grand challenge effectively, and we want to do it in the timeline that the science says we need to do it on, we need to scale these innovative solutions much faster. And so as someone who views themselves as you know, somewhat of a capacity builder, Working within those organizations, with those organizations, I'm fortunate enough to experience every week people who are just devoted to making the world a better place. And that is something that is eternally motivating for me because it can be challenging some days to get out of bed when you have, you know, these existential crises looming. And it can be challenging to get out of bed some days when you're wondering, you know, how am I going to keep the lights on or put food on the table? And we need to remember that humanity exists on this continuum, right? We're always going to have people who are on every point of the continuum along the way. And it's not enough to, you know, have a one size fits all blanketed solution from a societal change standpoint, because individuals are different. But to experience the people who have the privilege in many ways to be working on behalf of the environment or to be working on behalf of you know, social justice initiatives, people who are making those choices and able to devote their lives to it and, and sometimes pay the bills doing that work, I think is something that, again, it's a motivator for me, but it's also something that reminds me that there's still a heart to humanity. I personally don't get into very constructive spaces 
when I spend a lot of time thinking and focusing on, you know, the quote unquote negatives of the world, you know, and so I have people ask me often, you know, what do you think about all the people who don't believe in climate change? What do you think about all the, you know, people who don't believe in a higher power or spiritual process? That is really not something that I spend a lot of time. I don't want to say it's not something I spend a lot of time thinking about, but it's not something that I, I invest a lot of emotional energy in. And the reason that I don't invest a lot of emotional energy in it is because in order to do my best work, I need to stay in a constructive headspace and heart space, mm-hmm. right? So you always take the good with the bad. There's always black and white, right? And over the years, I've come to think about it less in that kind of dichotomous term and more on a continuum or a spectrum, right? So one thing a teacher told me years ago was we need people out in the streets protesting and you know, challenging the current status quo. But we also need people on the other end of the continuum who are working to build new systems. And one person can't do both because it's too emotionally taxing to be on both ends of the continuum at the same time. Mm. And that was a pivotal teachable moment for me to realize that, you know, at that time in my life when I was attending protests and I was out in the street and I was challenging the current system, I always felt a little... I could be having a greater impact, but I didn't necessarily know how, how to do that. And so when I heard that from that teacher, it was the permission that I needed to say, actually, I'm really passionate. I'm here to build new systems. So what does that look like? And that was, I don't know, seven, eight years ago at this point, maybe. And the last decade has been one of the richest decades of my life because I spend each day focused on what I can do as opposed to trying to all address all of the things that are, you know, that are can'ts. So is there hope? Absolutely. Is there a lot of work to do? Absolutely. And that's a big reason why I invested two and a half years of my life to put the book together. Because I think in order to address the grand challenges, right, social justice, climate change, things like this, we need more individuals who have the capacity to do that work. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to leave your day job in order to do it. We certainly need some people to leave their day jobs in order to do it. But not everyone has that right or that privilege or the opportunity to make that choice. But it's, it's amazing how much you can shift your quality of life when you go home at the end of the day and you're not complaining about your job, you have energy to, you know, spend time with your family or to go volunteer about that thing that you're passionate about. Those are really important shifts too. And so it's not necessarily a matter of, you know, one person can't do everything. It doesn't necessarily matter where you start. It just matters that you start. Mm, That's powerful. And also to, to your point about, you know, who can do what I do think to go back that it's all an experiential process. Like I'm the most peaceful person, but I'm from a country called Venezuela. And we got to a place where for political reasons, the country needed every single citizen out there helping democracy, you know, and I never in a million years thought, you know, I'm going to be protesting. My parents were always against (laughs) any of that. And it got to a point when they were encouraging, like, yeah, you should go out and like, you know, it was dangerous. People got killed on those protests. It was, you know, walking in there, I'm Catholic, with my rosary in my hand, doing something like putting my life at risk for something bigger than me. And it's just something that once you see it, you cannot not see it. Or when you feel it, that calling like, I'm part of a bigger thing. And I think it's part of the journey once, but you have to kind of leave a little bit that activation. I think it's like, secret switch we all have. And I think it's usually turned on by by deep injustice. I think that, you know, when we see racial injustices and, and the things we have to witness, you know, even the war in Ukraine and things that, you know, these are peaceful people that are minding their own business. And then something like this happens, it like it, it awakes something, at least in me. And I know in a lot of people that then you want to say, what can I do? That it's more than this. So that to me, that's the hope. That even when you don't think you have it, it's somewhere inside of you. Absolutely. And again, we're all on a continuum, right? And I'm I'm still pretty young and I grew up here in the Midwest. And the first time that I really experienced a massive cultural movement around social justice was after George Floyd was murdered. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I live in St. Paul. So it happened just mm-hmm. across the river in mm-hmm. Minneapolis here in Minnesota. And that as you, as you said it, I mean, it ignites something inside of you, you know, and it showed me a lot about my privilege growing up as a white identifying cisgendered heterosexual male. And it showed me how there were so many areas in life that I could be doing more to leverage that privilege for good. 
as opposed to unknowingly indulge in it. Mm. And the thing that, that I have to remember and the thing that I think back on in terms of my own personal transformation process was, again, I, I wouldn't have been able to say it at the time, hindsight's twenty twenty. I was violating myself with all of the choices that I was making in my life, right? And after 12 years of substance use, I was at a point where, I mean, you know, there, there, are, there are medical components to addiction. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to negate those, I, I, but I would like to set them aside for this statement. The violation of myself wasn't necessarily about self-deprecation. It was more about, I have more to offer. And in order to offer more, I have to dig deeper internally. And I have to do whatever work is necessary in order to be able to offer more, to get myself to that place where I can contribute more, because that's really what I'm passionate about. That w- that's what I say I care about. And why am I not doing that? And that lack of alignment internally was something that was a huge motivator. I mean, that, that, there was so much cognitive and emotional dissonance, which again, I probably couldn't have labeled at that time. It just felt like chaos. It felt like disruption. It felt like, you know, frustration. And so I think that's mirrored in the individual self as well as the collective societal self, right? When we see things like the war in Ukraine, you know, or, or January 6th, the uprising here last year, two years ago, I can't even remember. Mm-hmm. It's been a, it's been a mm-hmm. time warp for the last couple mm-hmm. of years. Yeah. If you're not internally aligned, you're not going to experience the impact of those things to the, to the greatest extent possible. And if I hadn't done all of that internal work and that personal exploration, I wouldn't have been as receptive to George Floyd's murder, right? So it probably wouldn't have sent me back to school into a program that focuses on social justice, right? Social mm-hmm. change for the common good. Probably wouldn't have landed there. I probably would have ended up in business school. Mm-hmm. And I ended up designing a program that allowed me to do, to do both. But I'm not sure I would have ended up there had I not done that personal exploration along the way to really figure out what is it going to take in order for me to be able to offer all that I have to offer. And that's a high bar, right? But we all go to bed with ourselves at the end of every day. We lay down our head on our own pillow and we have to answer the question for ourselves with integrity or not. How was my day today? How did I show up for myself and for others? And it's easy to shortchange that process. It's easy to lie to ourselves. It's easy to escape or avoid is probably a better word, the truth. And it doesn't necessarily need to be something that's heavy and emotionally traumatic. It just has to be something that's honest. And if we can answer that question within ourselves, honestly, we're already doing 90% of the work that needs to be done in order to show up and make the world a better place around us. Hmm. That authenticity is key. That, that's powerful. And, uh, you know, you, I think you put it in perspective for everything because we can all relate to putting our head down in the pillow and, and just being honest with ourselves and just being accountable for, for what we're doing. So I'm, I'm sure that everybody like me are like, you know, convinced that the soil and spirit, your book is full of wisdom as much as you have shared with us. And so, Ian, is there anything else you're working on you want to share with the audience? Anything we haven't touched upon, of course, the, the link to your book and to your page will be in the show notes. Anything else at this point that you'd like to share? The book is key. Um, I'll be on a book tour going through some major cities, Austin, Texas, San Diego, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, Salt Lake, and Denver over the next yes. four months. So if anybody is in those cities and they'd like to connect or they have an organization or an event that, you know, they might like to, they might think would be a good fit, be happy to connect there as well. Organizationally, you know, if there are business leaders and decision makers out there who feel like they'd like to learn a little bit more about our process, I'd be happy to have that conversation as well. But most importantly, and this is one of the central messages in the book as well, the greatest gift you can give the world is saving yourself. And so whatever that authentic process looks like, go do it. I hope that this podcast provided a little bit of motivation and inspiration for the listeners to contemplate a little bit more deeply for a little mm-hmm. bit longer today about what it is they could do and, and, and what more it would take to be the person that they're hoping to be in the world and experience the life that they're hoping to live. So I'd like to think I could take care of myself but I would love to connect. So if there are other people out there who want to connect, you can find me on social media, send me a note through the website. 
um, anything like that. But more importantly, connect with yourself. Mm, I love that. And so that it's a perfect leeway into my last question of every episode of Back to Basics, which is in those moments when you do want to connect to yourself, what is your practice, that your go-to thing that allows you to resource yourself? That's a great question. The long answer is that it depends on the day, hmm. right? I have this kind of core set that I've, um, of practices that I've cultivated or learned over the years, right? And so I would say the first thing that I do on my best days is I check in and I ask the question, what do I need? Because sometimes I need to go for a run. Sometimes I need to go to the gym. Sometimes I need to hit the heavy bag. Sometimes I need to, uh, you know, engage in a mindfulness-based practice like yoga or qigong or tai chi or meditation. So I think it starts there with checking in. If there's one go-to practice and I ebb and I flow with it, it's also journaling. It's just writing. It's just a, a concrete way to get my thoughts and emotions out of my head and on paper. And it feels like, um, you know, the, the term or phrase that I always use, it's just like a proverbial flush of the mental toilet. Like I can just get it out of my head and onto paper. And if I want to revisit it, great. If I want to think critically or constructively about it, I can. Uh, and if I want to forget about it, I can literally turn the page in the journal and forget about it. So I do a lot of writing, but I also do a lot of body-based practices. And again, on my best days, it just starts with, what do I need today? Sometimes I need to you know, lift heavy things, put them up and put them back down. Other days, I just need to put on my shoes and just run. So again, starts with self-awareness. Mm, that's that's a good one. I'll take that for myself. You do it you do it subconsciously, but you don't think about checking in with your what do I need today? Because you know, I'm a go-getter. So I know there are days where I just want to stay in the, in the sofa and just like rest, which I never do. But there are those moments where I do check in with myself and say, if I do this now, I'm going to be better later. So then you have to force yourself to just do it. So, well, thank you, Ian, so much for being part of Back to Basics and for sharing your wisdom and your book with uh, our audience. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. And to all you out there, until the next episode of Back to Basics. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Back to Basics. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. If you haven't yet, subscribe Rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts or any of your favorite streaming platforms. This is the best gift you can give us. Join me next week for another Back to Basics conversation. And if you want to find out about other exciting things I'm working on, visit LeticiaLatino.com. Thank you and until the next time.